Uh, the starting point is, I don't know if, how many of you are in done development studies at the beginning, there was a very simple logic about the role of FDI in development. It was said, without saving, there is no investment. Poor people cannot save. So domestic saving was not considered available for development in uh, developing countries. So the emphasis given was to for them to get the resources necessary for development from outside, for indirect investment, loans, and official development assistance. But uh, what was the promise from foreign direct investment? It was supposed to create employment, transfer technology, uh, diversify the economy, and save foreign currency and enhance the productive capacity of the economies and create a linkage effect within the economy. What has happened? As you know, 70 to 80 percent of Africa vegetates still in subsistence economy. There is no diversification. Uh, most of the foreign direct investments were of extractive nature. They were just taking out resources from without any value addition and beneficiation. I don't think Lumumbashi has changed ever since it was col colonized by the Belgians. Uh, Africa still exports primary commodities. Uh, and most of the foreign direct investments were in enclaves without any linkage to the rest of the economy. The jobs created are mostly the types of sweatshops, employment in the, in the, in sen the sense of skilled labor, and descent weights is very small. In this sense, it has not fulfilled the promise which was given to it. The lot of tax incentives given to multinational companies or foreign investors in Africa. These are uh, foregone and forsaken public revenues. And they have also unleashed in Africa the, a stiff race to the bottom competition. At the beginning, most countries were giving five years of tax holiday. Now, in some countries, it has gone up to 20 years. In the, in the mainstream development discourse, it's starting to change a bit, but there is a, a perception out there which, says, which makes Africa a continent which is on the life support from money it gets from the north. But if you look at this serious studies, Africa is a net exporter of capital to the rest of the world. A very conservative estimate puts it that Africa loses about 50 billion US dollars a year through illicit financial flows. The biggest share, over 60% of illicit financial flows, it is because of business practices. It's not as assumed by many because of corrupt African leaders. And then the other thing to look at is, why is it that a small island like Mauritius is the biggest investor in India? Why is it that, for example, the British Virgin Islands have 34 companies registered per inhabitant? I heard it from Barack Obama. He said there is a building in the Cayman Islands where 12,000 American companies are registered. Finally, we in the tax justice movement, we say that tax is not a cost. It is a contribution that each one of us should pay to have a coherent society, a cohesive society, and sustainable development. So is not tax practice one of the criteria we have to look at the behavior of uh, industries, uh, private investors? So tax practice, I think, sh should not be a criteria to differentiate between investors and scavengers. I think one, one of the things we, we see in the, in the conversation around foreign direct investments is the growth, economic growth, and, it, and the conversations always around developing countries and their need for economic growth. But again, if you look at it, the FDIs are going into natural resources, natural environments, so more extractivism. And, and then at the same time, the foreign direct investment discussions are happening in the capital cities, yet the, the investment, the extracting of the resources, whether it's in agriculture, land, 
uh, extractive industry, mining, oil. It's in the rural areas and the communities are not part of this conversation. We're not looking at what do we lose in, in ecosystems and water, in land, especially when we're giving land for agriculture, how much water do we lose? And do we see that the rural populations are actually, you know, are their economies growing? Are, are we actually destroying uh, small scale production uh, spaces because of this sort of uh, foreign direct investment? So you can see a really huge uh, decline in support for small scale producers because we're thinking about the large scale. Look at, look at the, take the example for Africa. All of a sudden, there's an increase in large scale. Um, acquisition of land, and yet we are in many ways disenfranchising small-scale producers, yet we know that 70% of the world's population is fed by small-scale producers. And so are we looking at GDP or are we looking at household economy growth? And I think that's where we need to start taking the conversation. The link between foreign direct investment and uh, development and growth is not uh, systematic, is not automatic, and it's not a direct uh, relation, uh, especially that the uh, kind of uh, sustainable development and economic growth that we are looking for is the uh, development or growth who is generating uh, jobs and contributes to the uh, enhancing of the productive uh, capacity building uh, of uh, our countries. Uh, talking about the Arab uh, region, the Arab uh, economies have generally uh, witnessed kind of a regress in, uh, in their productive uh, capacities and mainly in productive sectors, manifested in uh, stagnating shares of uh, agriculture, manufacturing uh, sectors mainly, and a rapid expansion of the low value added uh, services activities. So addressing unemployment as a main uh, challenge in the region cannot be detached from uh, really addressing the challenge of reviving uh, the productive capacities and breaking away from the concentration on patterns of low productivity and low job generating sectors. So designing trade and investment policies to benefit development objectives is crucial to a successful development trajectory. Otherwise, rules established through a limited the policy tools that allow tightening the linkage between investment and development. Our governments have not been able to apply the policies that will enable foreign direct investment to do the kind of thing that it should do. On the contrary, uh, what we've had, either through providing better terms to foreign investors or even giving them some guarantees, is that foreign investors actually uh, and, uh, dissipated domestic accumulation and actually supplanted in certain ways what uh, local investors can do. So what we do have, it has happened for the past 20 years in, in health, in water, and not only in Ghana, but also in Africa, we have a situation where foreign direct investment is coming in with the muscular support of its home government like the US to get better terms and conditions in a way that dissipates domestic capital accumulation and formation in our economies. And, and in this kind of situation, it's, it's, it's not possible for foreign direct investors to deliver on this promise uh, against all the evidence, against all the analysis. And it seems to me that to continue to believe that foreign direct investors can deliver on that. this context, it's almost like uh, what the first President Bush said some time ago, not the second one, that this is more or less like voodoo economics. In other words, it's like a, a, a fetishism, as it were. In order to be able to answer the, the question, you know, to, to, to discuss the questions of foreign direct investment and particularly around the idea of um, economic determination, I think you have to look backward as, as much as you do um, to, to what is happening right now. And so for, for me, the, the, the real issue is around whether you can have social, cultural, um, economic and environmental self-determination. One as a person, one as a, you know, as collectivities of people, whatever those various collectivities are, and in terms of the states um, within which we live. The, the mixed messages do abound in, in my region. I, what I see is a protection maybe of, um, you know, this idea of an internalized vision of what it is to be Pacific is, is incredibly important and the narrative is very strong. But then you also have this encouragement of a freer market model and that feeds into 
a lot of the, the kind of contestations right now in the region around Australia and New Zealand, uh, around the re-entry. I, I know all of us have heard about the Pacific um, pivot, the US Pacific pivot, um, but also around um, the, the, the whole conversation that we have to be having around BITs and around EPAs. Um, but, but I like to talk also not just about the states themselves, but about the fact that civil society has been part of this contestation from the very beginnings of states. So we've had the nuclear free and independent movement, and out of that, this amazing regional treaty. Um, In the 2000s and right up to now, you also start to see some of the legal and frontline challenges, um, civil disobedience, the use of human rights systems, in order to challenge some of these issues of extractive industries. Um, and I think that's growing um, into the future. But coming back to FDI and what FDI, this is, this is incredibly important. Is it about tourism? And that has its, you know, its value to the region, of course, but it also has the problem of repatriation of funds, where those funds are going. I mean, one of the key things we're really struggling with is, is now changing the conversation and saying that how do we bring in the citizens in the PPPs? And because a lot of this private-public partnerships are based on land so that now citizens can actually use their land as natural capital. Why can't the people be 30% shareholders in the investment? And that automatically changes the argument when, where they say the value of the land is based on what you are producing on it. Now we are saying no, the value of the land is what are you making out of the land and then you pay me based on what you're making out of the land. In this new era that we're entering, um, it's an era of mega, giga, and terra, million, billion, and trillion dollar projects. And that puts a different light on the questions we've been discussing today. Because when we hear our panelists talk about <laughs> agriculture, infrastructure, um, including the infrastructure for mining, uh, and logging, the challenges to land acquisition, the challenges to community and national development. We're talking about these things on a scale that we have seldom seen before.